So the topic of today's discussion is Islamic states in decline. Uh, we'll cover issues like uh, the status of Islamic states, recent territorial losses, the projected time frames before collapse in Syria and Iraq, uh, accelerating its transition from a pseudo state to an underground armed insurgency, uh, predicted future course and threat profile for Islamic states within Iraq and Syria, as well as its worldwide affiliates, how the threat to the West will develop and change, and the role of Al-Qaeda in potentially regaining militant Islamist supremacy. So uh, the panel part of this will last for approximately 30 minutes, at which point we'll move to a, a Q&A. So uh, today's speakers are uh, Ludovico Carlino and Colm Strack from our Middle East and North Africa Country Risk Team, and Otso Iho from the Jains Terrorism and Insurgency Center. So uh, without further ado, I'll direct my first question to Colm. So Colm, the Islamic State has lost much of its caliphate in the last few months. Um, how long are they likely to hold on to the rest? Uh, well, the Islamic State's caliphate has shrunk by more than 60% this year alone. Uh, as you should be able to see on the light red areas on the map uh, on the screen, they're now left with about a quarter of what they controlled back in January 2015, which is more or less the height um, of the, the caliphate's expanse. And significantly, this includes the loss of all major urban centers. So Mosul, uh, Raqqa is basically 90% lost. Uh, there's only a, a couple of neighborhoods left. Uh, and the core leadership and the government structures of the Islamic State were moved to the relatively small town of Mayadeen in the Euphrates River Valley, which you can also see on the map uh, in the middle of the sort of dark area in the middle. Uh, the key trend that we're watching at the moment is this growing split uh, between the local Iraqi and Syrian fighters who are trying to cut deals and surrendering en masse now, um, and then the more ideologically committed foreign fighters who have traditionally uh, sort of played the role of keeping the locals in line. Uh, recent losses in the situation that Islamic State is experimenting now in Syria and Iraq has had a tremendous impact on the Islamic State finances and especially on the Islamic State ability to uh, generate uh, revenue. And actually this is a trend that we have been flagging since 2016, so it's not really something new. Uh, in terms of number that you can see also in this uh, slide, uh, Islamic State uh, average monthly revenue has fallen dramatically from the 81 million we uh, assessed in quarter two of 2015 uh, to the 16 million that we assessed in uh, basically this summer, and uh, a reduction generally of around 80%, uh, which has involved all the streams of revenue that Islamic State was benefiting from. So oil smuggling and production of oil and also extortion and taxation on uh, local business and local population. But since the Islamic State has also lost control of the Al uh, Omar oil field in Erazu province in Syria last week, which was the biggest uh, in control of the group, and key cities uh, such as Mosul, even Raqqa now, Awija, as Colum was planning before, we do actually uh, expect uh, an even reduction of uh, this estimate right now. They're now effectively surrounded by hostile forces, but there's still, uh, there's still movement of people and goods between territory controlled by the Islamic State and, and other territory around it, and particularly in areas where there's um, heavy fighting or anticipated heavy fighting, uh, we're seeing large numbers of uh, internally displaced persons leaving the caliphate. So you can imagine within that sort of environment, there is a thriving people smuggling industry. And if you have the money, it's actually quite easy to be uh, smuggled into the KRG or into Turkey and from there to wherever you want to go. Uh, I think the going rate for, for smuggling an individual into Turkey at the moment is somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 US dollars. Uh, so it's well within what the Islamic State can afford to uh, to pay for its senior leadership and, and other key yeah, figures. We have seen uh, two local Islamic State affiliates in particular, so the one in Libya, as you mentioned, and also the one in the uh, Egyptian peninsula of Sinai uh, that have managed to increase the tempo and sophistication of their attacks in the last couple of months. Uh, while we cannot prove uh, a direct correlation right now between these increased capabilities and uh, the arrival maybe of fighters and people from Syria and Iraq, 
Uh, we have seen multiple reports suggesting that the Islamic State has actually managed to smuggle uh, key individual and personalities out of Syria and Iraq. And North Africa has been pointed out as the main uh, destination for, uh, for this trend. Well, if, as, as you can see here on the screen, um, already in the course of the Islamic State's rise uh, from 2014 to the present day, we've seen a real big increase uh, in the terrorism threat across Western Europe specifically. And as the Islamic State declines, uh, this is going to create really both immediate and long-term challenges for, for European security, and it will further increase the terrorism threat on the continent in the, in the kind of 10-year outlook. So we're really, really talking about quite long processes and timelines Their return here. will really have a big impact on terrorism, and their embedding into local networks would mean a kind of immediate injection of resources and capability uh, into local militant Islamist cells in Europe. And the bottom line here really is that this means more destructive attacks in, in Europe. These um, foreign fighters, they have significant combat experience. They have knowledge on how to handle and build viable uh, improvised explosive devices. They've got tradecraft for avoiding detection and lots of other skills that will be useful in the planning and e execution of attacks. The Islamic State now regularly uses uh, these quadcopter UAVs to drop uh, IEDs on enemy forces. And they're not as effective as artillery, as, as mortars and, and rockets that they use in terms of their lethality. Uh, and that's mainly because the, main, uh, the maximum payload is around about one kilogram. Um, but they are surprisingly accurate, uh, and it's had quite a big psychological impact um, in places like Mosul and elsewhere now as well. Uh, the group hasn't explicitly encouraged the use of uh, UAVs for attacks in the West in any of their uh, English language or, or Arabic, even propaganda. Um, but the only limiting factor really uh, stopping that from happening here is the availability of explosives. What about the, the group's chemical weapons program? Uh, are they likely to transfer this capability elsewhere uh, after the fall of Iraq and Syria? Uh, short answer is yes, but probably not on the same scale. So the Islamic State was the first non-state armed group to develop uh, its own sulfur mustard, which is a banned uh, chemical warfare agent, and to combine that with a projectile delivery system, so the ability to fire them with uh, mortars and rockets. Uh, we've recorded 76 chemical attacks by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, but interestingly, they've stopped, uh, they stopped in June when the group lost the city of Mosul. I think in the first instance, we're really going to see more of what we've already seen in the last two years. So. That means more of these types of low-capability attacks that use knives and vehicles and, in rare cases, improvised explosive devices by kind of lone actors or, or, or small cells. And I think the target sectors are also likely to remain pretty similar to what we've seen over the last couple of years. So that means soft targets and, and, and really the achievement of maximum fatalities being the, the key focus for attacks. Uh, they have been trying to or start to adapt this messaging uh, a while ago by introducing the concept uh, that seizing and holding territory is actually not the main and foremost objective of uh, the struggle. When it became clear that actually the Islamic State Caliphate was uh, somehow crumbling, and uh, this is somehow bizarre if you look in depth at the Islamic State propaganda because the group actually uh, built its reputation and also its appeal around the idea that they were, they were actually running and establishing a real state. They are now in some way uh, trying to put a lot of emphasis on the long-term trajectory uh, of jihad and this general idea of the infinity basically fight against its enemies. In the meantime, Al-Qaeda uh, has continued to grow. Um, if you look at places such as the Sahel um, or even Yemen, even Pakistan, Af Afghanistan, more than Pakistan, Syria, Al-Qaeda has managed to reinforce its presence, to develop deep relations with local tribes and communities, and uh, the group is actually well positioned to maintain this role in, in the near future. Yes, U.S. Um, government announcing their withdrawal, that's one of the indicators we're looking at. So we've recently seen the U.S. Uh, pull a lot of its forces out of western Syria, which is a sign that it's sort of trying to disentangle itself from the civil war and focus exclusively on the Islamic State. Um, so we're looking now for indicators suggesting that the, that the U.S. is looking to withdraw from Syria or, or how they will react to the struggle for the future of the country. We hope you can join us for other webcasts in our 2017 Country Risk series. We've got a few up here. We have a conference in 
Washington coming up if you're in town. Uh, we've got a Prices and Purchasing Summit for the Cosmos Club. And on webcast, we have um, Economics and Country Risk on the 7th of December, Prices and Purchasing on the 12th, and Global Macroeconomic Outlook on the, the 14th, following on from construction and economic stuff in November. Thank you.